miraculously survived the blazing inferno and the you know, collapse or explosion or whatever these buildings and all this nonsense they were telling us. And also I knew from my Islamic studies background that the, the whole idea that so-called Al-Qaeda could pull this thing off was, was pretty dubious to say the least. And, you know, he, the number one commentator in the Arab world, Muhammad Haikal, got up, you know, right after 9-11, he went on TV and said, this is ridiculous, Al-Qaeda couldn't do this. He said, I used to, I was the minister of whatever in the Egyptian government, and I ran Al-Qaeda, you know, infiltrators, and, and, and Al-Qaeda is just full of infiltrators from all of these intelligence agencies, including the U.S. and Israel. Uh, it's a cat's claw for intelligence agencies. Al-Qaeda can't, you know, they can't get up in the morning and uh, you know, sneeze into a hanky on their own. Everything they do is, is going to be influenced by you know, the world's most infiltrated, supposedly radical organization is Al-Qaeda. Uh, so, yeah, I, I knew that stuff. And so I was, I, I was pretty uh, suspicious and uh, bothered by 9-11 as soon as it happened. But then two years later when I learned that it was a complete false flag that they you know, blew up the Trade Center, that they attacked the Pentagon with bombs and maybe a missile or something. And it wasn't remotely what they told us. There were no hijackers. There were no hijackers. Like, so I figured that out. Whoa, that just threw me for a loop. So I said, you know, just like you with Waco, I said, well, this time they've gone too far. And, you know, I've got evidence right here. Look at Building 7. You know, any intelligent person looks at Building 7. It'll come down with Larry Silverstein confessing to demolishing it, you know, with the BBC reporting it 20 minutes before it happened. I mean, come on, you know, this is too obvious. How could anybody miss this? So I figured, well, you know, nobody's talking about this and somebody should. So I started shooting off my mouth and it, uh, it got me blacklisted from the universities and, and, uh, and it pushed me into my alternative media work now. So I followed pretty much the same career trajectory as you, Clay, just about a decade later. Well, this, uh, this whole blacklisting, I am, uh, you cannot get the Free American website if you go into Office Depot, if you go into Intel, or if you go into Intuit, if you go into uh, a library, you can't get the uh, Free American. And now it's turning these Israeli sites like the Abusive Host Blacklist. Uh, A-H-B-L dot com. If you go to there, you know, you can't complain because, uh, let's see, I bought uh, my thing from uh, GoDaddy. They don't like GoDaddy. So I'm listed as a porn site, and you can't get to me. So it makes it hard to sell books. When I sold a company to uh, a uh, publicly traded company, I sold half of it, half a million bucks, after my accident. And uh, we put a, we sent a contract on Thursday. I put a press release out on Friday. And on Monday, I walked into uh, the office, my new offices, and the CEO is white and shaking, and we can't go through the play. We can't go through it. You know, they, uh, somebody has contacted every stockholder in the company to tell them how much of a racist, how anti-Semitic you are. And of course, as soon as they say anti-Semitism, you know it's coming from ADL or Southern Poverty Law. And uh, so, so they their attack on me has been economical. They uh, the uh, there's a station that I can't be on because their advertisers don't want to hear about Israel. Uh, how do we uh, how do we compete with this? How do we deal with it? How do you deal with this? You've got uh, you've got the same type of uh, hate, and uh, I, I mean, I, I heard, I'm not going to play it, I'll let people listen to it if they want, it's all linked up on my website, but frankly, I, I, I won't even listen to my radio show, Lee Kaplan, because he's so damn obnoxious that I can't even stand to listen to him, and I did sit through uh, his conversation <laughs> with you, but, <laughs> you know, there, and there's one of them, there's one of him in every crowd that's sitting there going, uh, you know, talking in the back room. So they, they, every meeting I've been to, every uh, event that I've spoken at, you know, in some places like Paul Topetti with Poker Face, he just put on his Freedom Palooza, and even Larry Pratt got pushed uh, into backing off because of the anti-Semitic. Uh, now maybe, maybe, maybe I'm, maybe we. I've said to, in order to combat this. We really need to alter our thinking. Start thinking of our home as an energy producer, 
this is our business, it's always been my business at home, and how do we make it better? How do we make it better? Grow food in the backyard, put the shoulder on the roof, uh, we can make it better. But, uh, uh, how do we, uh, how do we deal with, uh, these people are brainwashed here, how do we, how do we make a living? Now maybe, maybe, I've said we had to rethink the, the, the farm thing, bring the farm into the city, well, maybe I'm I'm looking for the support. The American people have been so dumbed down; they won't support somebody that's trying to protect them, and they've been trying for 20 years. So maybe maybe I need to sign up with uh, Press TV. Maybe I need to uh, uh, broadcast this show on Al Jazeera. Is that possible? <laughs> Without, without, of course, you know, being arrested, put into one of these detention centers underneath uh, the uh, floor or in the in a, in a basement room. No, I, I've been doing a lot of work with Press TV and, and Russia Today as well uh, for quite some time, and they haven't thrown me into Guantanamo quite yet. <laughs> so I, I don't know, but I think, yeah, you, you, you should be reaching out. To, uh, uh, to Muslim women, we should be building these kinds of alliances. You know, the, the Zionists and, and the banksters play this divide and conquer game. Absolutely. And in particular, they've really divided the, you know, the Christians from the Muslims. That's been the big game since 9-11. And so to beat that, you know, we need to unite Christians and Muslims as much as we can. And, and there are different ways to do that. And one is, yeah, reach out to these audiences, work with places like Press TV and Al Jazeera, and, and Russia today. Uh, the foreign media has the resources to put the kind of stuff we do into a slicker package, which makes it more palatable to a larger chunk of people. Uh, and, and then there are some really good groups. I, I want to put some energy into this, too. There's, there's Mark Siljander and his work. That needs to be picked up on. Mark Siljander is a great guy, former congressman from Michigan. He was a very conservative Republican. He hated Islam. He went to D.C. And, and somebody, you know, he wouldn't go to the prayer breakfast when it was led by a Muslim. And then somebody nudged him and said, hey, did you know that actually, you know, Islam and Christianity are almost the same? And he said, what are you talking about? He said, well, let's, let's, you know, look at what, what the Quran really says and look at what the Bible really says in the original Aramaic. And so he did. And oh, he said, well, it, occurred, it turned out the Quran and the Bible were all totally on the same page if you read the Bible correctly in the original Aramaic. And so Sobander has been working to bring the uh, Muslims and Christians together by pointing out how similar the message is. Uh, and then, they, of course, no good deed goes unpunished. So the Zionists set him up and busted him on this ridiculous charge. What they did was they said they had this group, uh, a nonprofit group, say, hey, you want 50000 bucks to write a book? And so, like any of us, he said, oh, sure. So he, he this was a nonprofit for uh, increasing Christian Muslim understanding. Well, it turned out that what they did was they, they used the CIA nonprofit. Uh, uh, it was created by the CIA to, to fund Hekhtam Ar in Afghanistan, who was a CIA guy. And so they were pumping CIA money through this nonprofit to Afghanistan. And then, like, they just instantly, they give uh, him, they give Siljander the money, and then they dub this nonprofit a terrorist group. They dub uh, Hekhtam Ar, the, the CIA boy, <laughs> a terrorist. And so they just flipped this group upside down and called it a terrorist group and then used that to go after Siljander. They put him in prison for a couple of years for that. Uh, and that was his reward for trying to bring the Christians and the Muslims together. Now, I we need to support Siljander uh, and, and other people like that and really work on this. Send me, send me any information and I'll link it on my website. Uh, this, uh, I also, I would like you to help me get in touch with the, uh, with Press TV, with Russia Today. I've been doing this radio show for 20 years. we got two hours of a good material with guests like you on it. I've got books to sell, you know, I've got films to pay. You know, Kevin, I, I filmed the first Homeland Security meeting. And this may be the reason that number number seven on top of with Larry Silverstein's book, you know, all occurred in about in the mar month of uh, March. And, uh, you know, that's, uh, that's when they tried to kill me. But the uh, two face of FEMA, you know, in case of a single, uh, Colonel John Bringer, I've lectured law enforcement, and I filmed it. John Gentry went there undercover and filmed it. And uh, in case of a single outbreak of smallpox, 
a disease, by the way, folks, has been extinct for a hundred years. Uh, in case for single or very small pockets, a major metropolitan in a major metropolitan area will need 400,000 well-armed, well-trained, organized, disciplined troops to control the American people because some of them just won't follow orders. Some of them won't line up on the uh, Walmart parking lot to get a vaccine for a disease that's been extinct for, uh, eradicated for a hundred years in this country. And the same is true in case of an earthquake on a New Madrid fault line. I mean, they're telling us what they're doing. But yeah, that was, uh, that was told me uh, ten years ago, and that was a preview of Boston. And you talk about your friend being in jail. Now, I, I wrote, I did some of my best work in a Texas prison 45 years ago. I got put there for having marijuana in the state of Texas when it was a life sentence, basically 99 years, to mm. get caught with a joint in Texas. I've been in the uh, paraphernalia movement. I, I uh, helped start normal. I helped start high times. I did all that. I was the first distributor for high times. And I wrote books when I was in prison about the United States at some time in the future that uh, we had to turn science fiction because it was about uh, abolishing all the laws against victimless crimes in uh, 46 states. I uh, wrote it as science fiction, but it's happening now. We've got, uh, it's legal to smoke marijuana if you bribe a doctor. It's illegal to smoke marijuana in 20 states now. California has basically, uh, marijuana has turned it back in, has re become the number one cash crop of California, again like it was back in, uh, 37. Back, uh, and, and even our, our dollar bill, ten dollar bills had pictures of hemp fields back in 1913 on the back of them. Now, this whole thing about marijuana, and the pharmaceutical industry and the drugging of America and the uh, CIA and Mossad running all the heroin and cocaine into this country, which they've been doing since Vietnam and well before. This is all uh, kind of like Ayn Rand says: it's, uh, the government has no control over innocent people, so we got to they got to make they got to make us all into criminals. Now that's what they did with the pot. That's what they've done with tax laws. That's what they've done. Now they're trying to do it. If you disagree that uh, six million people were killed in uh, World War II, then uh, you can be thrown. At your, you can be a common criminal. They're trying to do that. They're calling it hate speech. What Clay's saying right now is hate speech. And they would love to have me in Canada, and they did this to what Ernst Zundel, they kidnapped him here in America, took him to Canada, and shipped him over to Germany to be tried for uh, denying the Holocaust. The, uh, we, are, we have more Americans in prison right now, on parole, on probation, than any other country out there, including communist countries with three or four times our population. But uh, I, I believe that we've, uh, this is, uh, if you, if you want to put, if a man with a badge can walk up to you and take you into, and throw you into prison for something you got in your pocket, we live in a police state. And, uh, you know, I've said to Obama, tear down, tear, tear down that ball, replace it with tables, let the uh, Peruvians, let the Colombians, let the Mexicans bring all their dope up. Put it on the table. Pay a uh, pay a toll on it. Pay a uh, pay your you know fair share here, and a lot of Americans come up and buy what they want to take it home with them and lose this billion dollar prison industry. I mean, come on, we got we're, we're putting our children and our sons and daughters in jail faster than any other country. That doesn't strike me as the land of the free and the home of the brave. And what am I going to be called, a druggie? Oh. <laughs> They'll call you every name they've got. <laughs> you know, I, I think the game plan may, may be to, uh, you know, keep kind of incrementally, you know, boiling the frog. You know, if you boil the frog slowly, he doesn't jump out of the pot. And, and then they can kind of crank up the heat all at once with another big false flag, another 9-11 style event. Uh, Michael Hayden. <laughs> 
the former NSA chief just recently said that, you know, he was talking about this whole Snowden scandal and the NSA spying on every American, and he said that if, well, this is a direct quote from him, uh, he, he says, uh, he says this metadata that, you know, basically every phone call we make, every email we send, he says, is now uh, being queried under very, very narrow circumstances. That is, they're collecting it, but they're not actually looking at it except under certain circumstances, he claims. He says then, if a nation suffers an attack, there are other things you could do with that metadata. There are other tools. So basically, what he, he goes on and talks about how if there's another big 9-11 style event, then they will take off all of the restrictions and, uh, you know, be using it uh, in a much more uh, militarized kind of way without you know, any protection. Well, I mean, for all we know, they're doing that right now. I think they're using a lot of that stuff to, you know, to bribe and blackmail politicians to control people. They can look at your email and your phone calls. They can figure out exactly which buttons to push to make you do what they want you to do. And if there's any blackmail material, they can collect that, and then, then they really have a hold on you. So I think that's what they're already doing. But what these guys are saying is that, you know, today there's this big controversy with Snowden and should the NSA be collecting all of this stuff. But wait till the next 9-11, and then they can get the whole population, you know, screaming, please, big brother, please, spy on us. <laughs> uh, control us. Read all of our email. Listen to all of our phone calls. You know, bug us. Put, put you know, put spy cameras everywhere. Put spy cameras in our bedrooms. Please save us from ourselves. You know, so that, I think, is a game plan. And, and, you know, we need to keep spreading the word about 9-11 and false flags in general to make it harder for them to do that. Well, I've been telling people for years, you know, it's in my, as a matter of fact, I got it in my film, True Face of FEMA that uh, you've got about as much chance of being killed by terrorists in America today as you do uh, getting eaten by a great white in Phoenix. The, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I put that in my book, too. It's a, oh, I use lightning strikes. You're actually about <laughs> like 40 times more likely to be hit by lightning than be killed by a terrorist. And, and this, uh, they, they rule on fear. I almost believe, Kevin, that uh, what we're talking about is some type of dimensional uh, being uh, that has a uh, root here that uh, feeds off of fear. I mean, you know, uh, and keep in mind, good propaganda. You know, I'm sure I'll lose some fans here if I make a remark about Alex Jones. You know, giving you 90% of the truth, and uh, uh, which is what propaganda is. Good propaganda is 90% truth. You know, look, this much of it's believable. With Alex, uh, he doesn't talk about any Jewish connection, doesn't talk about Zionists, doesn't talk about, uh, you know, with him it's all Nazis. And uh, I, I'm sorry, I have a really hard time telling the difference between fascists, Nazis, uh, Zionists, and communists. And uh, <laughs> I, I really, I mean, come on. And, and as uh, Rabbi Weiss, I don't know if this is the Weiss that you mentioned, he said some people call it com uh, communism, I call it Judaism for the masses. Communism was a born of Judaism. The Bolsheviks were Jewish, and uh, they uh, flooded out uh, from the place they've been living peacefully, the Pale Settlement to uh, help organize uh, the whole uh, Bolshevik war and end up murdering 60 million white Christian Russians. What about that? I mean, I see that happening here. Yeah, I see that happening right here. No, you don't hear much about that. You don't hear much about the 11 million people starved in the Ukraine. You don't, uh, but then again, you don't hear much about the uh, Jewish uh, harvesting of organs and uh, uh, killing, uh, killing uh, Palestinian children. How many? 600? 600 uh, in the last year? Uh, yeah, well, the, that was the study by the, the uh, British Medical Journal that was looking at this. I think it was in 2003. They looked at a certain time window, and they documented 600 cases of Israeli snipers murdering Palestinian children who were playing on sidewalks, schoolyards, situations where the direct quote is with minimal or no threat. Uh, and they noted that it, it appears that uh, is that the official policy? You know, we've really never prosecuted anybody, and, and you know, there are all sorts of eyewitness reports of that. I knew some people from Adams of God who went over to Israel, went into uh, Gaza, and actually saw these uh, Israeli soldiers shooting kids for sport. You know, uh, I mean, and Chris Hatches wrote a great piece about this. You know, he's one of our most respected journalists.
and what and, and big and that was the same thing. But he wrote a great piece called Out of the Diary back in around the same time. Some pressure in the UN, but the UN is most of the time. By the way, the one of the other things that really bothers me. Hello, Clay, you still there? Uh, yeah, I think so. I think so. You still hear me? Can you hear me all right? Yeah, we got you. Okay. There. Uh, yes, we can. All right. These. Uh, what are the, what are the, uh, I mean, this same thing is happening here. We've got teenagers killed with drone strikes in oil lovers, and uh, they haven't fired any of these uh, in uh, the United States yet, but it's certainly happening in other countries. And uh, it's, uh, it's like they, they, they are targeting the kids here at Sandy Hook and Waco and everything else. They've targeted uh, kids here. Is this, uh, are we looking at, uh, uh, is my vision of the United States becoming another Palestine? You know, uh, is that, uh, they are putting us in the cities. I think the cities are concentration camps. I'm sorry. But I, uh, I, I think this is, this is where your police state uh, exists. And uh, how many of you uh, listen to the show can go out for a drive here? And look up in your view mirror and see a police car and not get a little uh, tingle here, get a little rush, get a little twinge of fear. And when the uh, when the government uh, fears the people, we got liberty. When we fear the government, we've got tyranny. I think that's happening in the cities now. And I think actually we've got answers for this, Kevin. This uh, this whole sheriff, the 300 constitutional sheriffs. If you uh, if you start organizing, I mean, President Obama did it. Uh, he unfortunately was organ organizing for the communists, for the Zionists. But uh, if he could do it, why can't we do it? They kicked him out. Yeah, of, that's right. They kicked him out of uh, out of Iceland. They kicked the bankers. They put the bankers in jail and bailed out the people. I mean, all this money they're running. How many countries? How many countries in the world? 190 uh, something. And we're giving foreign aid yeah. to 193. Who's paying? Who's? Why are we giving them our? Why are we giving them our taxpayer money? Why are we supporting the whole world? Oh, because they're all members of the banking cartels. We're not supporting, uh, uh, I guess, uh, Venezuela or Iran, which are in the different banking systems. But the rest of the world we're supporting. We are the new world order, and we're paying off these uh, countries. With American money, aren't we? Well, yeah. You know, John Perkins describes how it works in his book *Confessions of an Economic Hitman*. You know, Perkins worked for the banksters directly. He wasn't even part of the CIA, the government, and they would send him down to talk to heads of state, presidents of other countries, mostly Latin America and some Asia and Middle East, and he would tell them, "I've got a stack of hundred-dollar bills in this hand, and I got a bunch of bullets in my other hand. Which one do you want?" And if they chased him out of the office and told him to go to hell, then the next thing you know, they're sending the so-called asteroids, the professional assassins, to kill the president who, who refused the offer of a loan. See, what Perkins was doing was trying to force these usury loans on these countries and get them in debt to the banksters. And that way, uh, they'll never pay back that debt. The interest keeps skyrocketing exponentially. And so then the bankers move in and they say, well, give us your water supply, give us your mineral, give us your assets. Uh, uh, impoverish your people, to turn them, you know, make their people slaves for us. As I, Perkins points out, they're building the first world empire ever on usury. 
In the past, empires were always built purely on military force. Well, now, alongside military force, actually ahead of military force, is this usury process of using debt to take over the world. So they're doing that, and then they, they print the money, and they, they force everybody to take their money. And using that money, then, of course, they're going to give them foreign aid, so-called foreign aid to the country. But that so-called foreign aid that they're giving is, number one, it's being gobbled up by this greedy elite in those countries, and the people never see it. And, and number two, that tiny bit of foreign aid that they hand over is nothing compared to these usury loans that the banks just make to those countries to make those people debt slaves of the bankers. So that's how the scam really works, and that the so-called you know, U.S. foreign aid is really a very small piece of the puzzle. Uh, it's just one way that they're bribing the elite in these countries to follow orders. And like you said, in a few countries, there's still rulers, uh, God bless them, who do not follow the Manchester's orders. Iran is one of those countries, Venezuela is one of those countries, Cuba is one of those countries. You know, it's ironic, because Cuba and Venezuela are both kind of leftist, communist, right? But at least they're independent. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, and Iran would be classified maybe as more of a conservative country, because it's, it's more uh, clinging to its religious values, but it's also independent. And uh, that's really the issue. It's not so much whether they're left or right anymore. It's really whether they're tools of the bankers or whether they're trying to be independent. And I think that's true at every level, from the countries all the way down to people like us as individuals. The real difference between two people isn't really whether one thinks he's liberal or conservative, left or right. It's really whether they've woken up and realized that they are <laughs> being controlled and robbed by this bankster elite. Now, and some people mention them. Go ahead. Well, that's, uh, that's absolutely right. These are our enemies. And they don't call it the New World Order for nothing. So, one of the things, uh, it, it's like, I'm not, uh, I may be the uh, free American. Maybe I'm the last one. But uh, this is a worldwide problem. This is a worldwide thing. Where are you going to run to? Where are you going to run to if the U.S. falls? We've got the... Uh, mobility, we've got the technology, and we got the money if we stop giving it to the feds to do everything that we need to do. And the, uh, so, I don't want to just take over, uh, take back the uh, United States. I don't want to just restore the Constitution. I want to see the Bill of Rights restored to every country, everywhere. I wouldn't have any problem with the UN if they based it on our Bill of Rights and, our, and, and controlling the uh, government, controlling the uh, bureaucracies, I wouldn't have any problem with it. And I think that's uh, what we've got to yeah. work for. And, and so I don't, I, I, am, I am about as loyal an American as you can get. I took an oath that when I was 17 years old, when I volunteered for Vietnam, I intend to fulfill that. I know that Gordon Duff and veterans today who we write for believe the same way. Now, what I think we need to do, and I'm asking your help to do it, is reach out to these countries. You got some oil money? Well, the, what the Zionists do to us is kill every business. They close down a successful business using a tax law and uh, put Dick Sim Cannon in prison where he dies in prison for violating the tax laws. He was a friend of mine. Lynn Merrill is still in prison for writing bolsters uh, wearing no uh, clothing. Uh, Eustace Mullins, after being robbed every time he went to the grocery store, you know, he's dead now. We need to work together. We need the support of the, to, uh, of these countries that are aside from the Fed. And we need to be supported. We need to be financed. The show needs to go all over the world, not just... Uh, to a uh, few hundred uh, subscribers or a few hundred uh, listeners in the United States. We need to go all over the world. The uh, books that I wrote can be enjoyed all over the world. You know, we can, uh, this radio show ought to be a broadcast and will be on YouTube, will be on Facebook, we can be passed around. They don't want you to, to know the other side of the story. They don't want you. I, I, I've learned more about the Muslims in this, uh, in this show here, Kevin, that we need to know. They're not our enemies. I, I, I do. There was a, a great movie with Anthony Quinn about the uh, 
Muslims leaving Mecca and going over to uh, Ethiopia, a Christian country, and uh, the Pharisees were chasing them, one of them arrested, one of them put in prison, and uh, the uh, Christian leader of Ethiopia said, no, they're not religious rebels. They believe in Jesus. So uh, it was a great movie. 50 years ago, probably 40 years ago. Yeah, that, that's a, a really good right. Yeah, that, that, was, that was the first really big, important uh, case of, of Christian Muslim cooperation and working together and recognizing that, that they're, it's almost the same. It really is about the same thing. And the, uh, those Muslims slain Islam to the king of Ethiopia. Uh, he said, yeah, that's, that's what we believe, too. <laughs> You're welcome here. <laughs> Great. Anthony Quinn. It was with Anthony Quinn. You can probably find it on the, uh, on the Internet somewhere. Kevin, we're almost yeah, out of time. I, uh, yeah. I'd like to invite you back here, and I'd like to uh, ask your help to uh, get in the show. We need to be putting this uh, show up on Veterans Today. We need to be putting it up on uh, Al Jazeera. We need to put it on Russia Today. I want to go on the world. I don't want to take over the United States. I want to take over the new world order. I want to make it something for the people. If you gotta have progress, if you gotta have uh, ambitions, you know, might as well set your sights high. <laughs> Sounds like the plan. <laughs> I'll be, uh, I'll be in touch with you. I think we're almost out of time. Yeah, I got maybe a minute here. Music will start. But okay. uh, I think, uh, no, I think we, I think by if we work together here, we can do this. All right. Well, I look forward to working with you in the future. Uh, God bless you and yours and your listeners, uh, especially you know, God bless you for waking up so early and and working so hard. Uh, keep up the good work. All right. And, and Richard, that was a chocolate chip cookie. Sorry if it interfered with the audio, but it was just too good to pass up. Kevin Barrett, all the links are on uh, my, uh, my site, freeamerican.com. Tell people about this, folks. Let's... Uh, Let's work together. Let's make it a better world, not just this country. We got our freedom here. They gave it to us. They fought the new world order of their day. We owe it to our ancestors to do the same thing. Kevin Baird, you're doing good work. Thank you again. Okay, thank you, Clay. Keep it up.